you guys call it besides the maintenance group? It's called a, um, they have different names for it now. But also health department, anybody doing HUD, housing. So you get all these places, all these different groups that you're going to basically tie in with what you're about to, uh, to, to look at now. So a lot of times the violations are going to start with you, but now it's if you get to see the situation. If you don't get to see the situation, then the violation never gets written. So what you want to do is you want to get into the standards of how can this be an automatic activity. So we're going to go through today and you're going to make it, we're going to show you how the building department now will have an automatic checklist for the permit process that needs a copy of all Farscape certifications. We're going to talk about housing <clears throat> and how they, in order to do a Section 8 housing, they're going to need a copy. We're going to talk about you signing off on smoke. Guess what you're going to need? A copy. When, you sign, when they come in with a, a sprinkler system that's signing off on an old building, guess what they need? A copy. So with OSHA, we're going to talk to you about OSHA. So today, today's class is NFPA. And as I was just telling those guys up there, my, um, I've taught m many classes, and very few states use NFPA. They all have their codes, adopted, modified, crazy stuff, you know what I'm saying? But then the NFPA was actually, I taught a class down in, in, uh, in Rhode Island, and even though they were using the NFPA, in the class nobody could tell me where it was, and I couldn't find it either. Finally, it was here in New Hampshire a couple of years back. All of a sudden, I had a guy that had a, a book with him, and he goes, oh, I know exactly where it is. And it was almost like, you know, one of those aha moments. I says, give me that book, where is it? So we actually, from there, we use it as mainly the main piece um, to basically explain the best of what it is to be uh, low testing or other evidence strength of a fire state. So let's start with the book that you have there, what we're going to cover today, okay? First of all, let's start out why we're here. Let's look to the back. So if you ever want, when you post this book somewhere, post this on your wall, but always try to have this facing you. That way when somebody tells you, why are you making me low test this fire escape? Because fire escape, they, fire escape, they either save lives or take them. It was never given that designation before. So when this thing was built 50 to 75 years ago, a properly maintained fire escape can never take a life. Fire escapes are made to self-evacuate. I don't need you as a fireman to come and get me. I got it. You give me a fire escape, I can get out of the building all by myself. And whether you arrive a minute, 10 minutes, or an hour later to the fire, I'm gone. And you guys use it, because I use it for egress, you guys use it for ingress if you so choose. You guys also use it for egress when all hell breaks loose. Okay? <clears throat> a statement. The older guys tell the newer guys training into fire departments. In case of fire, don't use the... Wow, these guys, usually I get the response right there. They say, don't use the fire escape. Because a lot of people just don't trust fire escapes anymore. So that's the kind of the buzzword on the, on the, on the down low. But, you know, you guys got it down low, then you're not even bats could hear it. But, you know, usually when I say that, you know, don't use the fire escape, it's usually coming right out of the mouth of the older guys trying to tell the younger guys, be careful, fire escapes are crap. They're going to hurt you or kill you. So, with that, this happened in 73 down in Boston. And because of that, we were using the IBC code. The IBC code, you must maintain your fire escape at all times. There was no five-year rule. So now with the five-year rule, what do you have? In Boston, the five-year rule helped basically have a trigger that every five years, somebody's supposed to prove it. It's not that you had to go out and find problems. There was a five-year push on the owner to do this on a periodic basis. You guys don't have it. You have the NFPA, but there's no five-year rule. But the, the IFC just came out with 2012 nationwide that all fire escapes must be examined every five years now. So that's something you're going to be using here in the state to saying that the IFC wants every fire escape in the nation examined minimally every five years and a copy must go to the fire official. Got it? So let's talk about what, what we've accumulated over time. All of this is at the National Fire Escape Association. So this first page, it's industry standards and procedures and guidelines. We're going to go over that because once you write a violation, people are going to ask you, what do I do? Right? So this is with the help of the state, some state inspectors that helped me write this. He goes, generify it. 
Every city building department and fire department has either departmental procedures and guidelines or uh, some sort of um, statement that they use as basically what they use to clarify some law that they're enforcing. So if you're an inspector, read this statement. If you're a repair guy, read this statement. If you're gonna paint it, read this statement because of the EPA law would let. So you can have this document sent to you. You can go online and get a free copy of this and basically it'll come in Word or, uh, or PDF and you can modify it to say yours. Whatever you want to say, or we can do it free for you. We would then just go and clip your website, put it up here, put your name and phone number and contacts up here, and then you can put this on your website, modify it even more if you so wish, so that when somebody says, you just wrote me a fire escape violation, what do I do? You can say, well, go on our website and get this, or you guys can send them a faxed version of this, or just steal the words from here, put it on your own city letterhead, and say, hey, this is what you got to do. So there's no shame in copying and stealing, but it's here. Prettier. Today we're going to talk about the lead issue. You guys know that anything older than 78 has lead. Can we weld on fire escapes anymore? So you can't weld on them now. Now we're going to do what they were really built. They were built with bolts. So guess what we're going to fix them with? Bolts. So nobody will. So you see some guy welding a fire escape, what do you say? No, no, no. $35,000 uh, fine if EPA is there. Is EPA there? No. <laughs> but they're coming. They love, you know, there's. They're supposed to be out there basically collecting these $35,000 fines, but just so you know, no more welding on fire escape, which was the, the catch-all fix for every fire escape for the past 50 to 75 years. Why are we going to mention OSHA? Today you're going to find an OSHA code that I, I stumbled across while I was teaching a class in Philadelphia, and to your amazement you'll find that OSHA says on 1910.37, and so I'll show it up to you, that any building under repair or alteration has to have two means of egress. Should it not have two means of egress, such as it has a front stair and a bad fire escape on the back, guess what you can do to that building? Close it. Because the OSHA says an employee, are you guys employees? Can't enter any building or occupy any building that doesn't have two means of egress or they've provided you with alternative means, meaning they can keep that crappy fire escape on the back, but what are you going to make them put up overnight? Scaffolding, right? And when they put up scaffolding, what do they got? They got the building back. And the fire escape is marked how? With big crap signs. Like, you know, this, on the inside, they boarded up all the doors and nailed it shut, so none of the electricians and plumbers and people use that because now there's a new fire escape the window that's been done for scaffolding. And on the outside, what do they do for the firemen? They put up these big, right? Do not use, unstable, you know? And a lot of times it means you guys surround and drown, right? That's what it's gonna become. So we're gonna talk, talk to you about OSHA. We're gonna talk to you about industry standard documentation, which is confidence test. This is assurance, not insurance, this is assurance, meaning in the, in the past, there's never been a confidence test. Can you imagine in 75 years, nobody ever came up with a fire escape confidence test? They were so happy for 75 years with an opinion letter that started and has been stating for the past 75 years, to the best of my information, knowledge, and belief, the fire escape is structurally sound and has been kept painted and is in conformity with the laws of New Hampshire. And that is a big opinion letter, which states what? It's the golden parachute for who? The guy that's writing the letter, it's a huge parachute. What's that do to the dead fireman on the ground? Well, you can use the parachute to cover him, right? Because that's an opinion letter. So opinion letters were the only choice for the past 50 to 75 years because it actually worked. Opinion letters actually worked because fire escapes were built so well that they, they could basically last untouched, unrepaired, unpainted for 50 years. How many years are we into them now? 75. 75. So we've taken the, the deadline on those things and we're 25 years plus on those because some of those are, are, are up to 100 years old. So and then you go to seattle.gov and you can get this right off their website. As a matter of fact, if you need other confidence tests for smoke detectors, sprinkler systems, you go to seattle.gov, go to fire prevention, and you steal all their uh, confidence tests that they have. 
Uh, you want another uh, place to steal some great ideas on fire escapes? Go to Portland.org. In Portland, we basically helped Seattle after people fell. We've helped Portland, Oregon put together one of the best programs. Now, it's always that case. You know, you have an East Coast guy, and where does he get his best shows? It's far away from, so we got a lot of things going on in the New England states, but believe it or not, they're jumping ahead of everybody because they're, they're not going to wait for deaths to occur. Anybody here hear about the Philadelphia death last week? I mean, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, Philadelphia? Anybody hear about the, Cal the, Cal the Philadelphia was three people fell 40 feet from a birthday party and the 22-year-old kid died from his injuries, right? On a fire escape that was unmaintained. So Philadelphia, which had a class from me nine months just before this, collapsed. Anybody hear about the Colorado fire? I mean, death. That was a guy doing the roof, stepping out on a cabled uh, cantilever that has the nose weight, and the cable snapped, and it caught the cable caught him underneath here. What do you think happened? He's missing a piece of the body, so he died instantly. Instantly on there uh, in Chicago, firemen climbing a ladder, usually the goosenecks. What happened? Either this or he let go, but he's on the ground and he's right. So fire escapes will get who? It gets everybody. It will get tenants, it will get firemen, it will get vendors. So we have cases here that we've done. So if you want to steal, uh, put another one down. If you want to go copy a great system, Regulation 4 in, in California, Reg 4 it's called. Now Reg 4, basically it's through fire prevention, they have a great system of, of it's a great ATM machine. For me to get my license out in California, it cost me a thousand bucks. I had to get and 80% on my, on my 100 questions. I had to be out there with a fire official showing them that I knew how to inspect the fire escape and then I knew how to fill out the paperwork. And every three years they asked me to kindly renew my photograph. But for everybody out there, it's an income producing, meaning every sprinkler guy must have a license through fire prevention. Every smoke detector guy, every fire protection company must be regulation for certified. So you want to make some money? Basically, they took it and they said, hey, we'll certify everybody. Go get your licenses. But in LA only, not just outside of LA, but in LA only. Now you need to certify with them to work in their city. So you need some money, uh, start the certification program. Copy Regulation 4 in California, okay? We're also gonna talk about reports. With today's digital technology and YouTube capabilities, if you're not getting pictures of problems and you have to go out there and physically see there's something wrong with the inspector, we're going to talk about documents you already have in your city. Anything over 35,000 cubic square feet needs construction control. You already have the documents. Make it happen so that in certain cases, fire escapes are under the control of a design professional. We're going to talk about industry standard documentation. How do you change a bolt and remove the rust? Well, it's, that's it. You change a bolt and remove the rust, put a new bolt in. That's the extent of, repair, of the repair. That's all covered here. Uh, this is a sample of, a, of a, a Boston certificate. That's it, that's all they want. And what's it say right on there? To the best of my information, knowledge, and belief, Farscape is in conformity, which is a outdated opinion letter, which means what, what can you get away with? And by the way, when you accept an opinion letter, do you assume any responsibility as a city? Yes. Of course, okay. So now we're also gonna talk to you about fire escapes. We're gonna prove today that all fire escapes rust from the inside out, not from the outside in. So the first point of failure of a fire escape is that, that connection, so that when you get to a fire escape and it takes 25 years to grow a piece of rust in a connection, it takes 25 years to grow a quarter inch, it takes 50 years to grow a half inch of rust, by the time you get to a fire escape and there's no paint left on the fire escape, how many years has it been rusting? At least 25 for getting all that, but if all of a sudden you start looking at the connection, you see quarter, half. You can already estimate how long the, the owner has ignored that fire escape. Can I low test a bad looking fire escape? Yeah, you can't, no, can. it's an automatic fail. I'll have pieces on the ground. My men have to physically walk on certain parts of this thing. You can only low test a fire escape that has passed a pre-low test evaluation, which is a yes, no questionnaire. So whenever you get opinion letters from now on, from a, from a design professional, 
you can send them an industry standard copy of a confidence test and say, thanks for your letter, can you fill out this and attach accordingly? He may throw at you, is this a state document, blah, blah, blah? He says, well, no, but it's basically, if you're going to pull that card, why don't you, before I pull my low test card out, why don't you copy the questions then from this form and answer them on your letterhead? Otherwise, can you just fill out the industry standard document that's here? And it's going to ask you yes, no questions about this Farscape that you're telling me you've certified. And in some cases, they also throw the word load test in there, which gets them in a whole bunch of trouble. Because they said, I've certified and load tested this Farscape, when in actuality, they've done, they haven't carried one bag on that thing. So you can kindly remind them that they may be causing some uh, damage to their license if they say such words. We're going to talk to you about how all fire escapes must be complete to grade. So everybody who has a fire escape ladder that ends eight feet off the ground, it's illegal. Somewhere back in the 40s and the 50s when they built it, the code was correct. You could end the ladder no, um, anywhere from eight to 12 feet from the ground because then you were providing other ways to the ground, either with a balanced stair to the ground, a balanced ladder that slides down on weights to the ground, but you were never supposed to just end it there. So any fire skip that gets examined with a ladder that ends off the ground, grandma can't jump eight feet. You, meet, you must complete it to the ground. So how do you complete it to the ground? You now take and extend the ladder onto that piece of ladder, which is a slide down to two to three feet per second with weights. You can also have it converted over to a staircase with weights that come out of the ground. Or now you can have what's called the fold-out ladder, which is a ladder that looks like a drain pipe when it's closed, but when you open it, you know, one half is fixed, but the other half drops down and it creates a horizontal 18-inch wide fire escape ladder. And the final, what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about tags. In the city of Portland, in the city of Seattle, this is Seattle, they they created an ordinance. Every fire escape in Seattle has to have a tag like your elevator tag. And what's that mean? When your guys are running down a smoky alleyway, when he looks up, and we're going to show you what they look like, they, there's a permanently affixed to the fire escape, seven to ten feet off the ground, there's a white tag. And on that white tag, it has who inspected it, when they last inspected it, and when the next inspection date is in the five-year cycle. So if there's no law in your state for five years, you can do a local ordinance that says, I want a five-year rule on this until the five-year rule from the IFC shows up, we want to do it now. So that's what you guys are going to do. But in the meantime, the third parties put up these white tags. You know who puts up these yellow tags? Building department, fire department. We also put up these tags as we examine these fire escapes, but you guys in your normal day-to-day -day walk around, you'll have these eight and a half by 11s laminated with your little lamination machine, put a punch, cu cu punch a couple of holes in it, and basically as you're walking along and you see something all rusty, all you need to go is attach this yellow or this red. You'll attach a yellow when it's just all rusty and no other evidence of life safety concern. You see dangling treads, blown out gussets, spalling cement, you'll throw a red on it. And when the owner or the tenant or somebody who pays the rent in that place looks at the tag, what's it say at the very top? What's the first step you do on a yellow? What's step number one? Contact fire official. It says right there, see? Contact fire official. What's step number two? Have a fire escape inspected. Step number three? Service. Service and load test. Now, for 75 years, you guys have helped. There was the perfect storm of stupidity. Because when you guys for 75 years were writing violations, guess what you wrote? You looked at it, looked bad, you wrote scrape it and paint it. So when the owner got a scrape and paint violation, he made two phone calls. He called Bob, you know, Bob the painter. He came down, looked at this five story, and he says, you know, I can paint this thing for about three to five grand. But by the way, I see some loose treads up there, you know, you should have them fixed. So this guy then calls Joe the iron worker to come down and paint it and fix a few of the treads. Joe the iron worker walks the whole thing and he says, you know what, dude, this, this thing needs a major overhaul and a paint job. He says, okay, how much? He goes, oh, I want 20 grand. So you got Bob for five grand, he's gonna paint the thing as is. You got Bob, you know, Joe the iron worker says, I, I need 20 grand to fix it and paint it. And he's got a violation in the middle that says only what, what should I do to it? Scrape and paint it. So he hires this guy to scrape and paint it, calls you up and says, hey, come on by, drive by. Hopefully it's still wet so that you don't walk up it. And do what? 
roll down your window, look out and say, hey, you've satisfied my violation. You've scraped and painted. So, everybody write down that the only thing you'll ever write on your violation on any fire escape you ever look at, you want to write down this. I need it. I need you to inspect it. I need you to repair it. And I need you to test it. Because as soon as you get those three questions, they're going to call you up back and say, um, you said to have it inspected. Like, like who? Then you can either read to him the thing you have. You say, well, design professional or others acceptable to me. That's, a word, that's the nation code. Design professional or others acceptable to me. So a, he may say to an architect, and you may say, what to that architect who does landscaping for a living? Do you have to accept him? Right? So, but it does say design professional or others acceptable. Others acceptable is somebody licensed in the trade. There's only two licenses currently. I have a Boston license and I have an LA license. Those are the only two licenses allowed to inspect fire escapes. Right? So when, can you, do you have to accept my license? No. Right? I can do everything I, everything I can to say, here's why you should accept me, you know. But you can also know, you know what I want? I want a structural engineer. So it's your choice. If you find that, you, that who's ever talked to you is qualified, you can authorize that person. But it's a design professional or others acceptable to the building official that says that right in the code, okay? So that's the only thing you need to write because the next question they go, who can repair it? So who can paint it? Anybody? Who can fix it? Now, there's a residential side of things, homeowner permit kind of things, and then there's, there's uh, commercial property or investment property. Who can only touch commercial or investment property? A licensed individual, right? Who's going to be overseen by who? By you or by the, evalu the person that did the evaluation? by the person doing the evaluation, because they're going to sign off on this person's work. Then who's going to paint it? Somebody who took a renovator's class, because painting even now today, even though you can do your own painting, renovators issues have come up even for homeowners who want to paint their own stuff. So fine lines everywhere, got it? And then when they say test it, what's that mean? Low test, that's what it says on my NFPA, right? It's right here on the... If you go right on the first cover, there's your code, everybody, right there. Read it at the bottom. FPA Life Safety 7.2.8.6.2. Believe that I found that in the class that I did a couple of years here? That before I couldn't even find that? I had to have one of you guys basically had a book with them show me exactly where it was. It was the greatest revelation. But there's your class. And what does it say? The authority having jurisdiction shall accept my low test or other evidence of strength. So who's the authority having jurisdiction? Is it the, the design professional? No. It's you. So you want the standard, go give me a low test on this 75-year-old grandma, or other evidence of strength is what I prefer, but not everybody wants to go that route. Other evidence of strength is going to be an opinion letter, which we're going to discuss today. Does it give you any assurance? No. Or a full refurb of the fire escape to avoid the low test. Does that give you assurance of full refurb and new tie backs into the building? So we're really going to discuss the whole class today on other evidence of strength because does load test give you assurance? Load testing. Will that give you the assurance you want? Yeah, it gives you a piece of yeah. So if they load test it, that's the law says two things. Load test it. Does that give you an assurance? Sure. Does that take away everybody's liability? The design professional, the city's and the owner's liability? Because we load tested it passed, what's it mean? or other evidence of strength. Other evidence of strength currently has two categories. The norm, 90% of the time, is an opinion letter. So we're going to flip that and say, hey, if you spot repair a fire escape as other evidence of strength and you leave behind original hardware, what will I order? That's in the code. Low test. If you fully refurbish it, what won't I make you do? Low test. So even in other evidence of strength, some people's going to, someone's going to try to jam an opinion letter down your throat. I've got 30 years experience, you know, my firm has 75 people, I do work for the state, blah, you know that, you know those kind of guys? Yeah. Good, you and your employees can go walk up the place. No, I just order the low test. <laughs> you say, listen, other evidence, is, other satisfactory evidence of strength, could the authority have in jurisdiction? Which means what? You can say, I want a low test. Or, 
why are you why are you not doing something with this Firescape now? Why aren't we refurbishing? So I'll tell you why Firescape's needed to be refurbished. You take any building built uh, back in the 1900s, 19, 1925, 1950, right? Every building in this country, when it turned 25 to 50 years old, usually all of them had all the electric swapped out, had all the plumbing swapped out, had the roof swapped out, had all the windows swapped out, had the heating system swapped out, had the exterior shingles or whatever swapped out. Guess what it never did? Fire escape. Fire escape got a paint job. That's all it got. So in the 25th to 50th birthday, if you probably maintained your fire escape, in the 25th to 50th, you would have swapped all the bolts out on that fire escape. Did anybody do that? Now, this fire escape is 75 to 100 years old is the average life of every fire escape you have in your city. Is it due for a refurb or is it due for another spot repair? Refurb. Leaving all these rivets and square head bolts behind. They look good, you know, they visually look good. Is that giving you any assurance? With an opinion on top of that? So the norm now is you're going to load test everything that comes your way. But you're going to make every design professional aware, listen, there's an alternative here. I don't want to load test, because load testing buys no bolt, buys no paint. I want you to give me other evidence of strength. And here's how I look at other evidence of strength. There's two categories in other evidence of strength. You'll spot repair it and give me an opinion letter, which I'm not going to be happy with, which is going to force me to load test you. Or if you at this time convince your client to refurbish the 75-year-old grandma, I'm not even going to consider load testing. And I'm also not going to consider load testing for the next 15 to 25 years because when you have new fasteners, what's the average life of a bolt if we have to refurbish it? 15 to 25 years. So you probably maintain your fire safe now from now on. I won't load test. Otherwise, if you spot repair and load test today, what's five years from now you've got to do? Spot repair and load test, and five years after that? So one of the advantages to refurb today is that you're going to put off load testing for the next 15 to 25 years because it's going to be considered other evidence of strength. You give me a 15-year-old Farscape today, I can still sign off for you and say, hey, other evidence of strength is that the, the bolts that are there are you know, 10 to 15 years old. Farscape is in pristine condition. It was all galvanized. It's, a, it's got a 50-year warranty on it. So don't think that load testing is totally out of it. In some cases, on fresh new Farscapes, you'll either do a load test or, it, and a lot of times in these Farscapes, you're just going to do um, other evidence of strength that they're fairly new. You, you may even choose in some of your policies to say, you know, uh, on some of these fire escapes that are new and galvanized, we may have a 25-year rule on, on them anyway, meaning I still want to load test, but every 25 years. As long as the owners properly maintain and seal and silicone these things, okay? So, we'll get back to this book several times. And uh, let's talk about why, when they were built in the 1900s, why a fire escape is safe and why everybody felt safe. See all these? Oh. Go back one. There you go. There was, there was, a, there was a shut off button. Okay. Um, you see these guys right here on the, let me just do the laser. See that? Is that a, roughly a five by five? Plus minus? Five by five is 25 square feet. 25 square feet at 100 pounds per square foot means it'll hold 2,500 pounds. If each one of these guys weighs 300 pounds with all this gear on, right, that means that if I was to find 10 guys that I can squeeze into a 5x5 five five with all their gear, that means there will be 3,000 pounds there, right? Can you get 10 firemen in a 5x5 five five box without getting too uncomfortably close to each other, right? So let's split that in half. Can I get five 300 pound firemen to fit a five by five square, plus minus, very tightly. Well, that's only 1,500 pounds, guys. We still have another 1,000 pounds on top of this, okay? So when you build a house, you got rooms that are built to 60 pounds per square foot, 80 pounds per square foot. Nothing is built to 100 pounds other than a fire escape. Decks aren't even built to 100 pounds per square foot. That's why I have a lot of deck collapses because they were never built to take a load. So this thing, now, if I have 150-pound tenants, how many 150-pound tenants, if I put 10 of them together, they're only going to equal 1,500. I still have another 1,000 pounds on top of that. So when fire escapes were first built and when they're built today brand new, 
Are they going anywhere? With, uh, uh, can you ever overload a fire escape? Today, if you can't squeeze them into the space, the, the question really is, 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 it, is there ever going to be a situation on a properly maintained fire escape, properly built, where they had a huge party and they ever overloaded? Is there ever a, capa a capability of overloading a fire escape the way that no. they build them? Because they don't give you enough space. So unless everybody does piggyback rides and they really start overloading, they bring an elephant into the play, these fire escapes are not coming down. They didn't come down in the 1900s, they're not coming down today. So that's the thing. So these were overbuilt. So the, the fact that they were overbuilt is why everybody just sort of let it go and they became the bastard child of egress. So even though the building went through many restorations, guess what? Never got a, a job, any work done on them. Now, fire escapes are going to be around for a long time, guys. They're going to be around for a long time because the answer, and, and then we're going to start getting into slides, is the code says, can I build a brand new fire escape? Yes. Even though the code says you, fire escapes are no longer allowed, it may, that's a correct statement. Fire escapes are no longer allowed on new construction. So that's a correct statement. You dig a hole in the ground, you'll never put a fire escape on that door. There's going to be two internal staircases. That's how they avoid putting it outside because you never, you never took care of it on the outside. So they changed the law that says new construction, no fire escape ever as part of the picture, ever. But what about these barns, these bell towers, these factories, these mansions? Guess what the answer is forever now to satisfy the means of egress when you've exhausted all other internal means of that building? Any building that's still up because some idiot invented bubble gum, duct tape, and, and paper clips, and they're keeping these buildings up in the air all these years, and they have a fire escape on the back, guess what can be maintained indefinitely? Fire escapes. Got it? So they had to stay. So just, just be aware. Don't, don't mis misread the law. Here's the codes. The International Fire Codes. You guys will love this because this is a game changer. They took the, the maintenance of fire escapes out of IBC as of 2012. They gave it to IFC, and it looks like the IBC code because the IBC code is basically this one here. Testing and certification all exterior fire escape systems shall be examined or tested and or certified. All exterior fire escape systems shall be examined or tested and or certified every five years. That's the key. And not to the building official, to the fire official, to fire prevention. So that's coming. That's already happening as we speak. Whether you've adopted or not, it's not the point. The point is it's coming for you. You know what I'm saying? Meaning you can reference and say, hey, there's a five-year rule. So you can either wait till this hits your state or go into your local ordinance and say, hey, local ordinance, I want in my city the five-year rule mandatory. I want tags in my city mandatory. I want confidence tests in my, in my city mandatory. Because we're not going to wait for the state till 2018 or 2024 for the final adoption of this, that, or whatever it may be. If there's a good idea out there, you can adopt it as a local ordinance. Got it? International Fire Code, it's the same code. Basically, in some of your fire codes, it says, anything that's in the state of deterioration or unsafe shall be repaired immediately, and depending upon structural condition, a load test shall be conducted. Well, let's get to your code. The one you use is the NFP. The authority having jurisdiction shall be permitted to approve any existing fire escape stair that has been shown by load test. That's the first option they throw at you. Or other satisfactory evidence to have adequate strength, which means you control the opinion. So if all of a sudden somebody with a lot of credentials is throwing their weight around at you, you throw weight at them. And what's your weight? Load test. You say, hey, you're a pretty heavy guy. But I'll tell you, load test is a lot heavier. So stop dicking with me. Because all I'm trying to do is do the right thing for our clients, and that is grandma is not going to get a paint job. Grandma's going to get all her joints rebuilt, and we're going to give her a pacemaker. You know what I'm saying? Because, yeah, she's going to go for another 50 years, but not your way. Not with a paint job and caulking and hiding. We're going to basically refurb the whole fire safe because otherwise I'm going to order the load test. But I want you to give me other satisfactory evidence to have adequate strength. And I know you're ready, to, you're ready to give me that opinion letter of yours that you've been throwing at this building for 25 years. I ain't taking it. Why? Because it doesn't bring any assurance. But as soon as I load test your opinion letter, what do I get? So the way I make an opinion letter have assurance is I 
the word? Low tested. So you can can you still accept opinion letters? Well, it's low tested. So an opinion letter carries a low test. Other satisfactory evidence does what to the low test? Nothing, which basically costs, you know, by the way, three to five thousand a floor, depending on the size and complexity of the building. So you got a five-story building, you're gonna be blowing fifteen to twenty-five grand to low test it. Does that buy any bolt any paint? So why don't I use that money towards what it really needs to be done, right? So we're going to cover that today. So the NFPA says that the sweetest, the, the fastest, and the easiest, but is that uh, depending upon structural condition, a low test shall be conducted? Who, who decides that? The AHJ. The AHJ. If a, lot of, a lot of people don't know what AHJ is. When Sometimes you have to write that out to people, say, the AHJ, they start looking like for some judge or something, somebody else out there. Like, that's the authority having jurisdiction. All right, uh, the International Fire Code, same thing. All exterior fire escape systems shall be examined or tested, which means what? Examined, tested, or certified. What is certified? It's an opinion letter. And now there's two types of opinions you'll accept, right? So don't, nobody's going to get mad. Somebody says, oh, I want to give you an opinion. I said, I'll take it. What do you want? Look test. Or how, do they, how can they not have an opinion letter? You refurbish, what do we get? Still certified, but now what are you getting? Assurance. They're filling out one of these confidence tests that has yes, no questions. Any, any space for opinion on there? It's yes, no. Did you remove all the rust from every connection? Did you verify all the connections into the wall? Did you duplicate all the connections into the wall? Is this thing ready for a load test? Yes, 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 yes. Great. I won't order the load test because you refurbished 75 year old grandma. And all the connections into the building, which I could not see or verify. You've duplicated them to avoid having to verify them because it was cheaper. We'll get into that also today, okay? You guys will love this one. This one is going to, this is the game changer. 1910.37, during repairs or alterations, employees must not occupy a workplace unless the exit routes, right, exit routes, required by this subpart are available and and existing fire protections are maintained or until alternate fire protection is furnished that provides an equivalent level of, of safety. Bring this into play, it pisses a lot of people off. So now your building department is gonna be crucial because every permit pulled in your city from now on requires what to be attached besides the plot plan, the fact that taxes are all paid, and you know, what other things do they require you to do before, you know, uh, design professional stamp of some sort. You know, there's all this stuff you have to do before they'll issue you or pay your fee. License numbers and registrations and all this stuff. And then what did they, what did they never ask? Right? So how many buildings in your city are currently under repair or alteration? And the employees mean, is it just the vendor, like the electrician and the plumber in that building? Or are you an employee that has to go in there and do some sort of examination? Will OSHA let you walk into a building that doesn't have uh, the exit routes required or an alternative? And by the way, what is that alternative? You walk in there, the front stairs is beautiful. The fire escape outside is crap. They promise they're going to do it, though, but at the end of the project. It's a million-dollar project, but they're going to do it at the very end. What do you say? Shut down. Or what can they give you to keep working the next day? Scaffold the thing. Let's mothball this thing because you, you mothballed it. You used to have it. You haven't properly mothballed it. That's all. Is a question coming? Yes. Um, are you saying that we enforce OSHA? You're not enforcing OSHA. I'm telling you as an employee, you can't go in that building. So how are you going to perform your, your duties? We're not covered under OSHA as government employees in the state of New Hampshire. I, I love to get challenged. Very good. Very good. Thank you. That's a great point. I'll use that in my next class, but the, <laughs> the employees in there, the vendors, yeah, the employees must not occupy. So the uh, the owner, you know, a, a ten-story building, they're getting the second floor. Can the employees in that building for all the other companies uh, occupy? Can the vendors, the demolition guys, the plumbers, anybody, the contracting company, can they be on that site? Can they occupy that site when there's all the exit routes haven't been taken care of? And don't forget, this is not just fire escapes, guys. Uh, existing fire protections are maintained, meaning can they, can they disconnect the sprinkler systems out of that building? Can they remove every fire extinguisher out of the building while they're playing with this thing? 
I just fall on the fire protection guys. This is not a fire escape code. This is fire protection. They must maintain fire protection at all times. But it's the key word here is exit routes, not exit route. Exit routes. And you can do the trash can fire. You know, they go, what are you talking about? Blah, blah. So it looks okay, give me a trash can. Let's put it here on the main entrance route that we have here. The window lighter on fire. And you tell me where, other than everybody jumping out windows, you know, how's everybody going to get out? So this would be on the RNFK 101, not on the unbeaten egress, not on the OSHA. I'm not telling you guys to enforce OSHA. I'm telling you that OSHA says this already. For everybody else involved in that building, Okay, that's what it means. That there must you must maintain two two for the rest of the world. They must maintain two, like you said. Like he said, the state doesn't care about you guys, and that you guys can go into you know just yeah. one room. <laughs> uh, uh, but we don't but burn. This, <laughs> but this is well. You actually need to go into a place that doesn't have the right rules so you can shut it down. Hey, this doesn't work. Because usually in a class like this, we get into a class. Blah blah blah. Thank you very much. The exit routes are. Clearly marked, right? Yeah. Two of them, right? Usually, so that's how every uh, every uh, every time you get into any building or fire uh, training of some sort, there's always the, the guy. Who do that. I didn't tell you when the smoking courts were. I didn't tell you when the bathrooms were. <laughs> <laughs> if there's a fire, so everybody hold it. <laughs> if there's a fire drill, please exit the building. Go all the way across the parking lot. So. Um, so, guys, uh, this is just to help because right now, you, you have to make this so you're not going to change anything you're doing. The game plan today is you're changing nothing that you're doing on a normal basis. But now you brought, you're going to bring everybody in. You're going to bring the building department, fire department, health department, housing department. You understand? These are all people that didn't know they had certain plays that can trigger calls back to you. And you make it a standard trigger. So anybody pulling a permit because of this, do you want your certification at the end or at the beginning of the permit process on any building? I'm fixing a toilet in my building, residential or commercial, institutional, and I have a fire escape, and I'm just changing my toilet and I'm pulling a permit. What do I need to, what's that plumber need to pull that permit? He needs a copy of the fire escape affidavit. Now, here's the point. He may not get it immediately, so the building department is going to still issue that permit, but because the guy didn't provide one, what's it automatically trigger? A violation, because instead of a certificate that accompanied that permit process, because you don't want to slow down permit process, you'll piss off a bunch of other people, but right now it's, you've just got a blind piece of paper there that says none provided, he has to provide it within how many days? Two weeks, 30 days, you pick, it doesn't matter. Because either during the process or by the end of the process, can he close that permit? If he never shows up with a certificate, can you close the permit? Technically, no. Now, the plumber can be done. The inspector went there and checked it out and said, hey, dude, the great plumbing, you know, we'll close it up and do whatever. But the fire prevention is now in the mix. Say, hey, yeah, the plumber's no longer here. It's been 30 days, but where's my certificate? Now we start fines, fees, and penalties. Because you're supposed to have that to open the permit. So a lot of times, depending on the size and complexity, you may give somebody a little bit of time to get their certificate done. Or you may say, you know what? We're going to use this really to hold this guy's, because this, this is a 10-story building. The fire escape is junk. Or can they quickly put up some scaffolding? And that eliminates this whole, I mean, they still have to get their fire escape certified. The scaffolding will basically buy the time so that the permit can proceed and close and all this stuff. So you guys figure that out with your building department. But it becomes an automatic trigger. It's an automatic trigger. When you guys go in to sign off the smokes so they can occupy, what must accompany your smokes? A fire escape, because when the smokes go off, where do I run to? To the fire escape. So what should be a normal? When the sprinklers go off, where do I run to? So what should be a norm with a sprinkler? So you guys need to tie this in what's already happening in every building. So you don't change your job. There's a trigger, there's a checklist act add-on to all these smokes, batteries, extinguishers. They, the fire protection companies always have to add a copy. Are you ordering an exam? You're asking for a copy of something that's already supposed to be done. But now it starts the 30-day trigger. 
So the meter stops running for 30 days, 30 days comes and goes, they've done their smoke and whatever they've occupied. What, what can start for you? Fines, fees, penalties. Because have they cured it? And there's a slumlord that's just going to ignore it like he's always been ignored, but what do you have on that, uh, on that building? The meter's running. And eventually, he'll you know, have to come up to it because it'll come back to him. Okay? Cisco, maybe you can talk on this. Uh, we're not an OSHA state by any stretch of the imagination, but we are an EPA state. And it's my understanding that anything EPA also is enforceable through OSHA, or OSHA is enforceable through the EPA. And that might tie in with some of the lead paint stuff that we're going to talk about. I don't know. Yeah, it does. The, the, the EPA didn't agree with OSHA, and OSHA didn't agree with the EPA because. They want anybody touching a piece of lead to where the astronaut suits draw blood and all this other stuff. The OSHA, uh, I'm sorry, the OSHA wants you to draw blood, astronaut suits, the whole thing. Uh, EPA, with their renovated class, they basically said, okay, wear this little white suit, put on these little plastic gloves, wear this little plastic mask, and, and collect some of these chips. So they, they're at odds with each other. The beauty about it is that they finally have something to talk about. So they'll work it out. May take five, ten years. They'll work it out, but it got better. It didn't get worse, but now that they they don't agree with the, the mode, renovating is a question, and and uh, OSHA is a question. But again, I only brought this up to help you guys understand that the people in this place, you guys can be in this place. And if this place had a fire escape outside, I would not be talking to you about the OSHA things about this fire escape. But the the girl that's at the front desk, she can't be here if this fire escape is out of commission. So that's all. That's, that's what this is all about. Channel 7, you guys remember the Station Night Fire? Okay. Uh, Hank Phillippe Ryan, she came out. This is 10 years ago, guys. She looks great. I look great. I look even better since we've done this 10 years ago. Uh, but she wanted to do a, p a piece on fire escapes and say, hey, you know, just you know, in case of fire, you can get out. When I told her that over 75% of everything I inspect fails, and 25 to 50 percent of everything I, I inspect has life safety concerns. She didn't believe me. I gave her a class in downtown Boston, down by the theater district. I only showed her the obvious: falling treads, blown supports, you know, cement falling, but visually like out of control stuff. And what she was going to do was a one-minute piece. It ended up becoming. The smoke, the flames, and the frightened faces all in a firefighter's line of duty. But Chief William Hitchcock remembers the night it wasn't the fire that almost stopped him. Oh, I was scared to death. <laughs> but the fire escape that broke underneath him. Where the railing just came away from the building. And our investigation found across Massachusetts, more unsafe fire escapes, rusty, deteriorating, crumbling, broken. And what state officials didn't know, the system they set up to keep fire escapes safe is also falling apart. The potential ramifications are disastrous. So let's look at this one. This expert iron worker is licensed to build, maintain, and inspect fire escapes. So then over here? For months, we examined dozens of them with alarming results. Looking at this today, would this pass inspection? No. In dormitories, at theaters, at homes, and apartment buildings. Rust is actually eating away the metal of the Correct. fire escape. Correct. And the bottom line? It'll get weak and then eventually it'll fall. This one has rotted connections. This one missing bolts, twisted metal. Would the stairs come down? No, never come down. This one a broken tread. So how dangerous is it for the people inside this building? This fire escape is definitely going to put somebody either in the hospital or it's going to put somebody at a, in a cemetery. Fire escapes are so critical. The state building code requires they be certified for structural adequacy and safety every five years. But our investigation found that safeguard is simply being ignored. Here's proof. We chose fire escapes at random in Boston, Somerville, Cambridge, Worcester, and here in Quincy. We checked building department files. But there's no fire escape certification. Not in this file. To see if building owners had submitted their mandatory inspection reports. There's no certification in this one either. Right. Bottom line, not one we checked in Quincy had been certified as safe. And the director of inspectional services admitted because of staffing shortages, the city has no idea how many other fire escape owners are breaking the rules. And as a result, do you know how many fire escapes in your city are safe or not? Well, 
I don't know. In Worcester, not one we checked was certified. In Somerville. No. Four more fire escapes. Did it fall through the cracks? Yeah. Not one up-to-date certification. And again, no system for keeping track. I, How can they get away with that? Be, I guess that the shortest answer of all is because we don't have the resources to sit here and follow up on these things. If structural deficiencies are reported, local building inspectors can actually evacuate residents until repairs are made. Would you talk to us on camera about this? No. But when we surveyed two dozen more communities, most admitted they had no idea how many fire escapes were certified. In Taunton, inspectors told us they haven't seen a certification in 25 years. Northampton officials said it's a cold day in hell when that happens. In Cambridge, too, not one of our test buildings was certified, and the official in charge would not come out to discuss it. In Boston, where there are more than 8,000 fire escapes, again, according to inspectional services, not one we checked was certified. Officials know they are required to enforce the building code, but they admit they don't always know if owners are breaking the law. The building code is being ignored. Right, but it's difficult to write a violation when you don't have knowledge of something like that. But state officials say for a critical issue like this, communities should know. And they warn the Massachusetts building code is not optional. Does it worry you that these fire escapes are not being certified? This is an important issue and should not be ignored. That's because after the smoke and flames begin, it'll be too late to learn you've got no way out. I can't stress it enough, Hank, that these things have to be maintained and, and someone's got to be watching. As a result of our investigation, state officials will now issue an alert to local inspectors. Meanwhile, if there's a fire escape on your home or office, you can contact your local building department to make sure it's properly certified. In the newsroom, I'm Hank Phillippe Ryan. So with that, what that basically came down to, she said, uh, the city officials were all now required, and in the city of Boston, you can't close a permit without having a copy of a certification. So whether it's a toilet, electric plug, or anything, you can't close that permit. Now this was before I found out about the OSHA, so how does that help that situation? You wanna put the, the, the request for certification at the tail end, go ahead. Or you can put it at the beginning and start the process, which sometimes will not get finished until the end of the permit anyway, which is to pull a permit, what do you need from the building department to help you all by itself, 24 seven, 365 days a year. Ask for a copy of the certification to start the permit process on every building. So they say, I don't have a fire escape on my building. I say, well then you don't need this one. It picks up everybody. Everybody needs to have it if they have an external means of egress. Got it? So this happened in Boston. And it was this that caused everybody to all of a sudden put the five-year rule in. She died. Her niece, eight years old, survived. And the fireman, with one hand, saved himself. He's alive today. Four stories. So, fire escapes can save lives or take them. Prior to that, they had a rule, which is, you know, fire escapes must be maintained at all times. Your NFP, NFPA rule has a problem. It has no five-year trigger. So unless you guys trip over it, there's no violation coming, and no owner is going out of his way to spend $25,000 you know what I'm saying? And get and fix that fire escape. He does spend fifty thousand dollars on a marble floor for the foyer. He will spend two hundred thousand dollars for the new rubber roof he has to put on that building. He'll spend a hundred grand on a new alarm system, but as soon as you tell him he needs twenty-five grand to fix his fire escape, the bastard child of egress in the back and give it a meal, what's he say? What are you crazy? I get that fixed for for four grand. Got Joe the welder coming by, who's been looking at it for me for many years, and Bob the painter. And it's true. That's actually interesting. That's, that's what's been that's what's been happening. So, with that, that's all you need to understand is that you need to start automatic triggers. Housing will give you automatic triggers. 
smoke detector sign-offs and any other yearly things that you do will be automatic triggers. So are you going to change your job? Are you going to go looking for the stuff? Or is it it's already there and you're just going to put up triggers? Just set up triggers with every department. Health department has triggers. Because can health department let anybody get back into a building that had mold if they don't have two means of egress? So no matter what they're fighting, you know, the health department, they don't have to let those people back in because there was something that happened. A raccoon broke in there and they have to evacuate everybody. Well, everybody's out. So that, to let everybody back in, they do an examination of the building. What's one of the key pieces that health department guy is going to let that person back in? That they have... So there's all these triggers. Just go, go create them. You got all kinds of inspections, even taxes. Uh, the city of Lowell basically sent out a tax letter with the taxes. They sent out a letter that says, did you know your fire safety are supposed to be maintained under the five-year rule? So we'll show you a copy of the tax letter. So anything that can go out to everyone so that it picks the few that have these, uh, these means of egresses. Philadelphia. Witnesses say it sounded like an incredible explosion when the fire escape... Witnesses say it sounded like an incredible explosion when the fire escape of a Philadelphia apartment building suddenly collapsed and injured three people. NBC 10 cameras were there as a friend holds on to one of the victim's hands, who is apparently conscious as the victim is placed into an ambulance by medics. KYW-TV reports a man who was critically injured and two women were rushed to local hospitals. Police believe the bolts of the fire escape appeared to have been rusted and dislodged from the brick wall of the apartment building. The victims fell more than 30 feet to the ground and now the incident is under investigation. Worth noting, the complex is more than 100 years old and even on Philadelphia's historic registry. Local reporters are all pointing out the city's licenses and inspections department hasn't filed any violations in the past when it comes to the old building, so Sunday's collapse came without warning. Neighbors say the three victims, reportedly all in their 20s, may have been partying on the fire escape landing before the incident. For Newsy, I'm Elizabeth Hagenorn. We did a class for them. Fire escape engineers inspect the summer. Fire escape engineers inspect the summary video yeah, we here in all Philadelphia. All right. All right. This is this. I have to be in the site. One area information that I'm getting out of this. Uh, two, three days later, at this piece right. here, which this is the back used to be up against the building. These two brackets here used to be going to that fourth, fifth floor up there, where you now see the two blowouts: the blowout on the left and the blowout on the right. And it used to be attached there. And then this staircase, which is here, it went to that platform up there. And that platform up there also had a bracket, which is now laying inside the floor below. So they either were going up to that upper floor or they were on this fire escape. It's an abandoned and upper floor. Like so go on this side. It's an abandoned upper floor. Or above, which looks like it's all blown out. As soon as it let go of there, it basically tore away and fell down, or um, the, the bracket that holds one of the legs, one of these legs is sitting on a bracket like this, and it's up there. You can see it on the floor below there. See? There's the bracket right there. Uh, there's the other piece that's stuck in the wall. There's the hole in the wall it used to be. That bracket was there to that corner. And it used to support the staircase that used to go to that other top corner there. So that's how this piece got its way down here and it kind of did this. But the key is, this is what it looked like, that bracket that used to hold one of the corners. And then it would go from here up to a window that, not here, but it's way up there. But So basically when this released or that other piece released, it pulled away and brought this with it. Or if this failed first, and then it released the remaining piece, but I believe everybody was either up above on this piece. But see how it ties into the back? Single bolt with an angle on the back. So this down here represents that there's an angle along the back, an angle along the wall, okay? And this platform is pretty shoddy, but basically creating a corner supported only by this brace. This brace goes into the building 
And so should that corner fail, which it did, um, basically this brace is no longer holding the staircase that came from the upper platform way up above and fed that upper window. So if they were on the, wind, on the platform itself, two or three people, but look at that whole piece there. That looks like that's been, that's not fresh, that looks like it's old, looks like it's been uh, through rust jacking, ice jacking, and just uh, maybe the cement was getting porous, and it uh, basically pulled away from there. Now, when you come down here and look at this, this is evidence that something was happening between the iron, because this is all eaten. This is where the through bolt used to be into the building. I still want to find out how this was tied into the building, whether it was through bolted into the building or not, because those pieces go in there, right there, okay? And that's the above. So whether or not there was through bolting or was properly attached, but this evidence here that through ice jacking, rush jacking, this was all getting pushed away, this piece may still be updated all rotted away. And there's the other hole for a through bolt or for an epoxy bolt. Usually it's a through bolt. And if it's all eaten away because water got behind here and ate everything, and it looks like it did get behind here. Okay, aside from this, we've got original hardware, we got rust, and all the connections and we've got welded treads and rust and all these treads rust and all these treads okay but you got rust in the connections so this seems to be through rust jacking knife jacking that it ate whatever was connecting it see this is all rust inside here this should all be preserved but this is basically showing that there's been no evidence of any maintenance original hardware 50 to 75 year old Square head bolts, there's no more bolts left, no more head, no more nut. So there's evidence that rust was a major factor. It ate all the steel here. So there's very little steel left. So this was getting pushed away from the building until that finally one day couldn't hold it anymore. This thing just basically pulled away, pushed away. And if it also, in conjunction with that bracket, like the one below, if that bracket up above was also weakened, that's why this whole entire thing came crashing down, crashed here, and fell here, or fell that way, or really, I don't know. But again, I guess there's some blood right there still from the situation, but it was pretty chaotic. He fell into the pit, so now that he fell down. Any questions? He fell into the pit, they have to video. the pit. 866-649-0333. Nobody uh, asked me to do this. I just came here. This was an alleyway that is open. You can come in through there. And basically, I just came through. This is a public alleyway uh, in the back. And this is just my own investigation. Nobody asked me to do this. I'm just most curious as to what caused this to fall. So as I pull back, and so the rest of that fire escape was still in bad order. And here's the thing, while this was being investigated, was the building still being occupied? Of course. And they asked for an immediate investigation, they asked for immediate, immediate this and immediate that, but was the building still occupied? Yeah. Got it? So, the answer when you have situations like this and things are going to get mothballed, what do you ask for? Scaffold. And then what happens? Then you can preserve the situation and really take your time to investigate. Because my concern was, this was on the ground, who was going to save that? Because they already filed a lawsuit on January 27th. I think this happened January 13th. In January 27th, boom, lawsuit. I think the city of Philadelphia is getting pulled in. Mm -hmm. Nine months earlier, we gave a class to 50 building inspectors for the Liberty Chapter, saying you got hand grenades, not just in Philadelphia. You got hand grenades in New York, all the way to LA. We got hand grenades in every old city that has buildings 100 plus years old. So we have a class here. We have hand grenades in your city? How many have written a violation in the past six to six to twelve months in this room? When I asked that question in Philadelphia, you know how many wrote, raised their hands? I just was in West Virginia and I was teaching a class and asked the same question. I was in Washington, D.C. and asked the same question. So what's the norm? And the reason why you don't write it 
is because you don't know how to cure it. You didn't know where the code was. You didn't understand, you know, what power you had. You were relying on somebody else to take care of business. That's all. So now that you have all these codes that we shared with you, and you, you think there's going to be any political blowback on this? And, and, and who are they fighting now? So if there's going to be political blowback, they're going to be fighting whether firemen die or not. Is that a safe thing to fight nowadays? Whether firemen die or not? What's, what's been your, your uh, concern with that? How are they fighting it on you? Just need the budget cutbacks and all this other shit? But in regards to the fire escapes themselves, at least what you need on a, on a building, what do you need when you get to a building when you're fighting a fire? You trust your ladders that you guys low test? How many ladders get low tested on trucks? And how often? Yearly. Yearly. Bags, sandbags. You bend a ladder, what happens to it? Out Right? They have to low test your trucks. And you bend that because some tree fell on it during a fire or something happens. What happens to that? So isn't, don't you guys drag around a temporary fire escape system? Yeah, here's a full fire escape system and you guys have any certification for that? Are you gonna have them? You know what I'm saying? So this is that process of just basically, uh, as I said before, are we looking to certify fire escapes or are we starting a tagging program in your state? Because we just wanna find out what condition they are in today, right? So if you were going to start tagging your fire hydrants, what would be the process? Because somebody came out and said, hey, this type of fire hydrant built has this defect. After so many years, these things pretty much rot out. So you guys need to go through your entire city and identify the condition of the fire escape. So pre-plans, rookie training. What can you guys do with your rookie force that needs to be trained and they have pre-plans and they have all these things that they gotta go do? Can you guys create a tagging system with everybody that's part of the, the training force? They go into your town, they walk down all these alleyways and they identify fire escapes and they bring little yellow tags and little red tags, right? And they have zip ties and all they do is when they walk up to a fire escape and, it's, yeah, and it has rust on it, no dangling treads of any kind, what do, they, what do they just leave as a reminder on that tag, I mean on that fire escape? Yellow, yellow. A yellow one, it says on the three things it says on the yellow tag. What's the three things it tells the person to do, whether it's the tenant, okay. the owner, or the agent? Inspect it, repair it. Inspect it, have it inspected. Have it load tested. looked at, and then have it tested, right? Mm -hmm. And it says, but the first thing it says is contact the city official, the fire official, right? So you can create a program where you're going to go and start the tagging process because you're just using that to basically say, hey, we, are, we have some deaths in Philadelphia, Chicago, and Colorado, and those are the ones that we hear about. There's other ones that you, we're not hearing about where somebody got maimed and hurt, but it didn't make the national news yet. And we need just to find the current condition of the fire escapes we have. And so as we walk with our pre-planning uh, uh, pre teams down these alleyways, we're just going to identify which ones and have these people start calling in through our taxes. We're going to send out a letter and, and we're going to start in the downtown so that everybody down there knows that we need to get these with a tag as soon as possible. A yellow and a red. We're not telling you to fix it right away. We just need to know whether they're yellows or reds. But should you want to, we're going to start getting these things certified. We'll give you one year to get your fire escape certified. And, but in the meantime, it'll carry a yellow or a red. And should your insurance company do their yearly investigations and ask, why do you have a yellow and a red and not a white, what do you say? Well, until they certify with a third party. Yes, question. Is there any exemption in any of this for height of fire escapes? I mean, is there anything in there that says? Yes, I think the question he's asking is that there is certain, for example, in New Jersey, I can jump 16 feet and that's my second major degress. But if there's an escape there and it's at 15 feet, it still needs to be inspected. You have a, you have a, the code is very clear. All exterior steel wooden stairs must be examined. We're talking about fire escapes right now, but that's just a little tippity of the iceberg. There's some stuff underneath below that I'm gonna show you. That's what the code really covers. So you're really, you're gonna start and get your beak wet with fire escapes. 
but you're about to step into, you know, the Antarctica of, of uh, all exterior steel or wooden stairs, balconies, bridges, areas of refuge. If it's outside collecting rain, you got to maintain it. If otherwise, just enclose it. Then we can't touch it. That's another, that's a building department walk through, blah, 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 whatever. But you keep it outside and it's an exterior steel wooden stair, which includes decks on the back of your house. I need an examination on that. Not come there after a big party collapsed the thing. Remember, 27 people in Chicago died on a fire escape, not a fire escape, on a, on a deck on the back of a house. 27 people died. Can you imagine how many more were in that party? And that wasn't built to 100 pounds per square foot. Got it? So, again, we've been working with uh, Seattle and Portland, Portland, Oregon for almost 10 years. You think this is going to happen overnight? It just started here. We're just telling you, you know, what's the first year? I, what I do need from everybody here is cards so that I can work with you directly, get a copy of the video that's being recorded, get you copies of standard documentation. I'll go a little off through him and he'll get it out through you guys. But we'll work with each individual department in, in such a way which is like, I would recommend that the next three to five fire escapes, you make them case studies for your department. So you pick out a, a residential one, and no matter who's inspecting it, just have the National Fire Escape Association work with you to say, first of all, was it properly inspected, this residential piece of property? Was this commercial piece of property properly inspected? And was this church properly inspected or institution? And then just use that to study. Basically have, to have the, the stuff looked at. So you gotta look forward and start this program. You gotta look at the present and check who's doing it, what are, what are they doing now? But then you gotta also look back and say, you know what, I just had a collapse of a, a thing and it was all signed off and we already closed that case two and a half years ago. Can we go back there and see whether that was, because I just accepted some of these documents in the, it's in my file and I just accepted it that it was great. Can, can we go look at, because when can you order a low test? Anytime. Anytime. So if all of a sudden you had a collapse of something somewhere and then we go back and we investigate it, and when you go, if we go, we're going to record you. So we're going to come back and use that to help train the next guys and say, look, this thing was signed off, reputable firm, but what didn't they see? And you get underneath there, you see original hardware. You get underneath there, you see some, some rust still in some of the connections. You get in there and you see some stuff. Then you go back to the documentation and it says, oh, it was certified and low tested. It's not that anybody was trying to break the law. That was just the norm of how everybody did it. So all of a sudden, you just, you just reignite that thing. You say, okay. Uh, Mr. Owner, I need a little test on this. He's going to go, oh, but I paid 10 grand for these guys. Goes, yeah, yeah, no problem. Bring them in. We're going to get this all just done right. And we, we, everybody misses, missed the beat here. Oh, well, why? He said, well, if you want to know why, just watch on TV. You know, uh, I mean, on YouTube, there's a class that, that tells you why. But now I've realized that we, you know, we're, we were supposed to eliminate a hand grenade. And all we did was basically put the pin back. In. <laughs> that's all we did. So I'm telling you, we need to get rid of the hand grenade. That's all. So we made a mistake two and a half years ago, and we just need to. So we're going to look back a little bit, start in, the, start in the present, get everybody together, health department, building department, you know, get all these guys in together. You know? So you know, the occupancy permit. What's a, what must be attached to the occupancy permit? Copy of an affidavit. Why? Because that's one of the triggers you put. You can, you can put these triggers everywhere. Okay, just thinking about them and which ones make sense. So what happened here? What happened in Philadelphia is what happened. This is a 22-story 22 building in, in Chicago that was going to be turned into help, uh, elderly housing. And a lot of people don't realize that the veneer. See the veneer? Let's just make sure I'll check out time. And I'm going to end it on this slide. And we'll take a 10-15 minute break. So, every, every, so we'll do a class every hour and a half, and then we'll. Uh, um, see all the rot inside? See the rusty tears coming outside, guys? Yeah. Yeah. What that means is that the parapet wall starts leaking 50 or 75 years ago, feeding a constant uh, yeah. rain down, the, down between the two, which is usually just a little quarter inch, half inch. You have veneer. People don't believe it. This veneer is, is non structural. The veneer is your vinyl. The veneer is your clapper. You know, the veneer is just the paint job. It's just three inches thick. But that's all the veneer is. It's not structural, but it's tied back in to the masonry wall, or usually two to three courses of dirty red brick. And then the pretty brick is on the outside. That's all it is. So the fire escape ties into the back end. But a lot of times they rot from the inside out, and the indicator is rusty tears, 
rusty tears. Okay? So this is the one, the unknown on every fire escape. And it takes about 300 to 500 bucks to do this. Open it up, fix it, then close it back up with a mason. Or you got a 75, 100 year old building with bricks from way back when. You let sleeping dogs lie. And right next to this connection, you drill a three quarter hole, put a, you put a through bolt to the inside with a new plate, or an epoxy bolt that the temperature and the, build, and the wall allows. And you basically duplicate the connection for 50 bucks. So do I charge my client 500, open it up, and then put it all back together? And this can open up another can of worms that I don't even want to touch on this building. Or do I drill a three-quarter hole and epoxy it in and then mechanically fasten it back to the connector? Have I satisfied your other evidence of strength for you? Because now I'm at 200% of what it should be there. My master is my new through bolt. My slave is the, the unknown. Do you, want, do you want me to go and open it up and tell you what's there? Or do you care? Don't care. You don't care. So leave these 100-year-old buildings alone. Don't open them up. And just duplicate the connection. So if you can't verify it cheaply, just duplicate it. And in some cases, what we're going to do on that fire escape is if we have a bank of brackets, you know, 12 brackets going across a wall, I'll put an angle, a 20, 30 foot piece of angle, two by two or three by three, along the whole wall, epoxy bolted or through bolted back into the building, and then from that one angle, I tie in all the brackets, mechanically with a bolt. That's called unification. That means in order for that platform to hit the ground, what must come with it? The whole wall. So did we have a fire escape failure or a wall failure? But by that time you got a wall failure, there's, there's nothing left on that building anyway. Got it? Okay, so let's take a uh, 15, 10, 5, 10, 10 to 15.